And now to deliver the welcome speech, uh, allow me to invite to the stage Professor Mithat Sabahi. He's a co-chair of the WPA Thematic Congress, co-chair of the Organizing Committee, international fellow of the American Psychiatric Association, adjunct professor of psychiatry, GMC University, ex-regional vice president, Eastern Mediterranean region, board member of the World Association for Psychosocial Rehab, consultant psychiatrist, Beautiful Minds Medical Center in Abu Dhabi, and head of psychiatric rehabilitation division, head of psychiatric scientific section, Arab Federation of Psychiatrists, and he's one of the founders of the psychiatric rehab unit, and SKMC, and he's my best friend. Please welcome Dr. Mithat. Thank you very much, my dear uh, brother, Dr. Mufid. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to uh, welcome you again physically after a very long duration of uh, having uh, some hybrid uh, sessions. Uh, the last time we met uh, uh, was in ADNIC uh, 2021, and it was the World Psychiatric Association, uh, World Association for Psychosocial Rehabilitation Congress, World Congress, and now we are honored uh, with your presence. Uh, today, uh, I'm honored to welcome Her Highness uh, Dr. Modi Al Nahyan and uh, Her Excellency uh, Dr. Hande Zaabi. Uh, thanks, Dr. Naheda, for supporting us. Thanks, uh, Professor Afzal, for giving us this opportunity to have the first uh, thematic uh, Congress of the WPA in the region. And we are honored to have it in UAE, my beloved country. Uh, I am I'm here for um, so many years and I'm honored to be. Uh, one of the uh, people uh, who has many hats. Uh, I have a hat to be uh, an ex uh, SKMC Saha Embry. I'm now working in the private sector, and I'm honored to have all my dear uh, friends and colleagues attending with us and uh, delivering a very unique conference. Uh, this conference is unique not only in being the first time to be held in the uh, uh, region and uh, in the topic itself, having the uh, uh, innovations in psychiatric rehabilitation and treatment, but also it's unique that we have more than 20 countries and, uh, from all over the globe uh, uh, participating with us. We have um, 70 speakers. We have more than 750 delegates registered up to the moment. Together with the uh, speakers and the uh, rest of the uh, colleagues, we are exceeding 900. Uh, uh, participating in the conference. We have uh, more than 100 uh, speakers and moderators. So it's a very unique uh, conference. Uh, also, it's a unique um, uh, conference because of the support of many organizations to us. And I cannot uh, um, forget to mention uh, dear uh, uh, colleagues uh, who are supporting us from the Department of Health at Abu Dhabi, uh, Family Care Authority, the Egyptian Association for uh, Cognitive Behavior uh, Therapy, uh, SARC uh, Psychiatric Federation, the uh, Arab Federation of Psychiatrists, Egyptian Psychiatric Association, and Asian uh, Federation of Psychiatrists. Uh, if I forget anything, just please uh, forgive me. Uh, it's um, a heart-beating uh, uh, presentation, and I'm giving it from my heart, not preparing anything. So I believe things coming from heart goes to heart. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to welcome you all. And um, please, uh, if there is any uh, defects or mistakes, forgive us, because we are human beings, it might happen. Uh, uh, we are unfortunate that one of our colleagues had a heart attack uh, yesterday, Dr. Manal Alewash, so uh, she couldn't uh, present her presentation. We just have a, a video recording for her presentation, so forgive us for this. But uh, all the best for the coming three days. I'm sure you will have a state-of-the-art presentations state-of-the-art speakers, but we have a state-of-the-art audience as well. Those people who are you are always making our um, uh, conferences vibrant and interactive, and we are proud to have you with us. Uh, thank you very much, and looking forward to see you the rest of the uh, conference. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, allow me to invite Professor Jonas Mankata, for a welcome. Please, he's a conference co-chair, chair of the section on psychiatric rehab, World Psychiatric Association, professor and chair for social psychiatry at Medical University 
of Vienna, guest professor of psychiatric epidemiology unit at Gothenburg University, past president of Australian Association of Psychiatry, Psychotherapy, and Psychothematics, and past president of the International Federation of Psychiatric Epidemiology. Welcome, Professor. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction, and thank you for inviting me to collaborate with colleagues here in Abu Dhabi. Uh, you know that all medical diseases can have a more chronic cause, a more severe cause, a more mild cause. And if the cause is more severe and more chronic, often people have difficulties in everyday life to have a job, to live alone, uh, to solve all problems in everyday life. This is the same with mental disorders. Uh, some disorders have more often a chronic cause, while others are less often a chronic cause and are less often severe. Uh, rehabilitation in psychiatry means helping people to reintegrate into the society, to become more autonomous, and uh, to become more responsible for their own life again. Overall, this is about 3% of the population. 3% of the population means that in all countries of the world, one of 30 persons would need any kind of psychiatric rehabilitation. That's a lot. We need individual intervention as well as support from the society for this. Uh, the WPA section on psychiatric rehabilitation is engaged since many years to support people and colleagues who are engaged for rehabilitation. We try to combine people from research, from clinical work, uh, to support collaboration between them. We are organizing courses, workshops, symposia at several congresses. And it's a large pleasure and a large honor that we have the first congress on the team of psychiatric rehabilitation. I'm very indebted to the colleagues here in Abu Dhabi, uh, especially to Professor Asapai and Professor Shavet, the president of the World Psychiatric Association. I thank you so much for the opportunity to have a Congress on this team, which is essential for so many people all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Bukata. And uh, now for a warm welcome message, may I call on Professor Tomatz Schulz, Chairman and Director of the Institute of Psychiatric Genomics and Genomics, University Hospital, Institute of Psychiatric Phenomics and Genomics in Germany. Welcome, Professor Schulz. Shukran jazeelan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Ana ismi Thomas Schulz. Ana tabib nafsi. Ana ustadu fi Jamia Munich fi Almania. Wow. Wow. Bada dalik. Al ustadu fi fi Jamia Vilaya Nova York fi fi Syracuse fi Janub Vilaya New York. Um, ana kadalik um, sekretir mudir WPA sections elan um, fi inklisi. I'm the. It's an, has been an honor to be the secretary for the scientific sections of the WPA for the last six years. And as such, I'm so pleased and I'm so happy to be here to see what the sections can be doing, what the sections are doing here, especially the section on psychiatric rehabilitation together with our great member societies. The Society of the Imadar al-Mutakhida, the Arab Federation, and all the other societies of the region. So this interaction has proven so beneficial, so critical in promoting our work. We have the almost 70 sections of the, sub, of the World Psychiatric Association. They are the backbone. They are the, the scientific motor. They bring the energy with global diversity from all walks of life, from all regions of the world. And here we can show that together with you, the regional um, colleagues, the regional societies, we can discuss very important topics. So as um, the Secretary for Scientific Sections, I'm again very thankful and grateful this project um, this ongoing project, World Psychiatric, Feder uh, World Psychiatric Association, is such a great success. Um, thanks to you, and I'm um, looking forward to a great conference here 
fil Imarat Mutakita, fil Abu Dhabi. Shukran, Jasilam. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor Shields. Come on. You just uh, chanted us. May I know who is your Arabic language teacher? Uh, Chicago. Yeah, I mean, Chicago. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you, thank you. That was amazing, actually. Thank you so much. Uh, and now, uh, to deliver another welcome address, please join me to welcome Dr. Nahida Nawiaz Ahmed. The very dear Dr. Nahida, a leading pioneer, future is waiting, transforming, doing a lot of positive things. He's a consultant psychiatrist at Al Maqta Healthcare Center and she is the head of Mental Health Council, Department of Health, Abu Dhabi. Welcome, Dr. Anay. Thank you so much, Dr. Mufid. It's, uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be here. I would like to begin with congratulating the extraordinary leadership of this organization, chaired by Professor Afzal Javid, Dr. Medhed, and Professor Johan uh, Van Kater. Congratulations, it's a it's beautiful gathering, and uh, thank you for giving us the privilege of participation and presenting our mental health strategy. It's been a privilege of my lifetime to be the clinical lead for Department of Health, wherein we have been working tirelessly for the past few years on uh, putting together a mental health strategy. In a few minutes, you'll be listening to our colleagues present the mental health strategy, our achievements, our initiatives underway, and you will get a sense that how beautifully we've customized and tailor-made this project for our community. It's a holistic project, and I couldn't be more proud uh, to to be a clinical lead and member of the team under the exemplary leadership of Her Excellency Hinda Zarbi. We've been really enormously blessed for the encouragement, support, and courage we get from the leadership uh, across the healthcare center. So um, thank you all for taking your time and coming to our country and uh, for your attention and participation. Uh, we, would be our, we welcome you here wholeheartedly. Thank you again, and I hope you'll have a fabulous two days, uh, three days in the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nahida, for the warm welcome. And now, finally, we will deliver the official opening speech by the boss, Professor Afzal Jawi. Please welcome him. He's the conference president. He's the president of the World Psychiatric Association, honorary professor of Institute of Applied Health Research, University of Birmingham, UK, Honorary Clinical Associate Professor, Warwick Medical School, University of Warwick, Chairman of Pakistani Psychiatric Research Center, Fountain House, Lahore, Pakistan. He's a consultant psychiatrist in UK and in Pakistan. Welcome. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Her Excellencies, Dr. Nahida, Dear organizers of this Congress, I, on my personal behalf and on behalf of World Psychiatric Association, brings the greetings for this very important and innovative Congress that is taking place for the first time in this region. WPA's interest is shown by presence of the section chair, as well as the executive secretary of scientific sections for participating in this meeting. As it has been mentioned that this particular topic is of great interest to mental health professionals. It is not only psychiatrists, it is also psychologists, social workers, nurses, and everyone who is working for and working with the mentally ill people. One of the main objective of this Congress was not only to raise the awareness about different mental health issues, but also to generate interest among the policy makers to get a prominent visibility about mental health in the national programs. And the presence of Her Excellency and the 
advisor to mental health, that certainly shows that how effectively this message has gone and how important the Abu Dhabi government and the officials are considering and taking mental health in their day-to-day -day work. It is such an interesting aspect that this Congress is attending by so many participants and we have got participation of more than 20 countries. I'm sure the deliberations and the presentations in this Congress will go a long way in making a case that there is no health without mental health. And at the same time, we will be able to convince all the stakeholders that this is the century, this is the time, this is the year that we need to think, think and rethink how can we engage our patients, how can we work hard to make their lives more comfortable and more easy. I once again thank all the organizers, participants, and especially the representatives from the Department of Health of Abu Dhabi government, and also our executive secretary for sections and the chair of the section on psychiatric rehabilitation for their ongoing support. I would also like to thank the president of Sark Psychiatric Federation, Dr. Gautam Shah, and president of Asian Federation for Psychiatric Association, Professor Prasad Rao, for their support. These two organizations are WPA's affiliated associations, along with Arab Federation for Mental Health. And all these affiliated associations have very kindly been supporting and promoting the cause of mental health in the respective regions. So it's indeed a matter of pleasure and privilege to start this meeting and we hope and we look forward for having your views, your participation and your guidance. How can we lead the world in this particular area? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Yes, may I call to the stage Professor Methad, Professor Schulz, Professor Manaka. Thank you. And, and now we would like to recognize our esteemed individuals and supporting organizations. We are grateful for your outstanding support and significant contribution to making this conference possible. Allow me, give me the honor to call for Her Excellency Hinda Zahabi for the Department of Health Abu Dhabi. Okay.
Association for Cognitive and Behavioral Therapy, Dr. Rinam Ali. Arab Federation of Psychiatrists, Professor Hisham Rani. Egyptian Psychiatric Association, Professor Mumtaz Abdul Wahab. Dr. Mithat will take it on his behalf. For the Asian Federation of Psychiatrists, Professor Prasad Rao. Last one, I will not read it. It's written special trophy for Dr. Mufid Rahu. Okay, now we are um, honoring uh, Dr. Mufid Rahu because he's a master of ceremony. So please. Uh... Organizers, thank you so much. Okay, now, um, thank you, everybody. Uh, and with that, we conclude the official inauguration. And without further delay, let me welcome our esteemed chairperson for the plenary session. Or I call him Professor Al Zain Amara, senior, senior consultant, psychiatrist, pioneer, established the mental health services on the best international standards in Abu Dhabi for a long time. And he's a legend.
I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Zin Amara. Uh, Dr. Zin Amara, I call him the godfather of psychiatry in the United Arab Emirates. You can divide psychiatry before Zin Amara and after Zin Amara in this country. I'm honored to be one of his students. And it's a pleasure and honor to learn from him. So I, I, I should say that in, uh, because of all what he did to this country. Thank you so much. Professor Amara is, a, is one of his kind. He's a senior clinician, academic, and he's a, a novelist. And he's a poet. That's why to welcome him, I would like to say two words of poetry. I know you would like it. I've heard it more than 15 years ago. I don't know who said it, but it's amazing. Al-Arabi, somebody, I'll say Al-Arabi, Habib Taghabat Mudda Tawila, but when I returned, Ayn Wahda Bikad, he said, Bikad Ayni, Ghadat Al-Bayni Dama, and Ayn Bil Buka, Bakhulat Alayna, Hadi Bikad, Hadi Ma Bikad. فعاقبت التي بالدمع ظنت بأن أغلقتها حين التقينا حرمتها حتى مشوا في الحبيبة لما ترجع حبيب الزين أنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests, distinguished audience, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I'd like to extend my gratitude and great thanks for the organizing and scientific committee which has cordially invited me to chair the session. The plenary session of this prestigious conference. Uh, I have heard what they have said so far. I feel flattered, but I feel honestly and sincerely dedicated to the profession due to the unparalleled support of those who are talking about me, Professor Mithat, Dr. Mufid and the rest, without their support, their energy, their enthusiasm, and their sincere commitment, devotion, dedication to the job, I wouldn't have been sitting here to address this distinguished audience at this age after retirement for that long, long time. I'm really grateful for all, and I am really overwhelmed by the invitation to share this session. The session is about public mental health and strategy of mental health by two distinguished speakers, Professor Abdul Javid, Dr. Ahid Ahmed. Two faces of the same coin. Same important topic of mental health, which is a cornerstone of any development of future mental health service in any country. And you will find the pioneer, Dr. Nahida, who is now starting current status and the future strategy. And the top of the pyramid, Professor Afzal Javid, who is the leader, he is the least, the president of the World Psychiatric Association, and there is nothing that you could hope for more than being as a summit of the organization which is dealing with the modern development psychiatry all over the world. 
Now, to start with, I want to introduce Professor uh, Afdal Gabit, and I think I've got a rich CV. I've heard part of the tip of the iceberg, what has come out from what has been said before me, but I will go a bit further, extra lines to uh, add to his uh, enormous challenges in psychiatry. So he's a consultant psychiatrist and honorary professor in the Institute of Applied Health Research, University of Pakistan, and uh, honorary research associate clinical professor at Warwick Medical School, University of Warwick, UK. He is the chairman of the Pakistani Psychiatric Research Center and board member of Fountain House Lahore. He graduated from King Edward Medical College, Lahore, Pakistan, and received higher specialized training in psychiatry in Pakistan and UK. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists and has also been awarded with fellowships of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Edinburgh and Ireland. He has served the Royal College of Psychiatrists in the UK as deputy and associate registrar and chairman of West Midlands Division of the College. He was elected to the Honorary Fellowship of the College in 2022. This is the highest award membership of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. His role in international psychiatry is highlighted by his current position. Here is the least. I hope for the most. He is the president. World Psychiatric Association currently from the year 220 to 223. Go further to add, since he has also been the past president of the Asian Federation of Psychiatric Association from 20. Uh, 17 to 19, and World Association for Psychosocial Rehabilitation from 2012 to 2015. His area of specialized interest, very important and very relevant to his topic today, is social and transcultural psychiatry and psychosocial rehabilitation and psychiatric research. It's a galaxy of psychiatry. His academic skills have been invaluable when publishing more than 175 scientific papers, and being author of six books, monographs, and different topics of psychiatry. This, he recently received one of the highest civil awards, Star One MTS, by the government. And today, I don't know what he's hiding in his pocket for the improvement of psychiatry. The world, you join me in applauding Professor Dolph Gavit to come to the floor. Bismillah Rahman Rahim, respected honorable chair, thank you very much for your kind words. I was just sharing my thoughts with my colleagues at WPA that this is amazing that how our professional colleagues respect the senior people by inviting them and by recognizing them for their great efforts and for their great contributions. 
This means a lot of us, and this means a lot many things for us to follow. Thank you very much for coming and gracing this occasion. Dear participants, I will be giving a general overview about the importance of public mental health, which World Psychiatric Association is taking up as one of the priority agenda for this triennium work. This is my disclosure. There is no conflict of interest for this presentation. What I will do during the next 20, 25 minutes will highlight the importance of missions and objectives of WPA with a special emphasis on the proposed action plan highlighting the importance of public mental health as a priority area for our future work. Well, psychiatry in the 21st century is really bringing us with an exciting time. And the reason for this exciting time is that over the last one century, we have moved from asylums, mental hospitals, to community, and from community to home. And then there has been recognition of epidemiological aspects and sociological domains of mental disorder to a large extent. But one of the most important achievement that we have moved in psychiatry from madness to mental health problems. And this is reflective for our future objectives and directions. And to gain this, we are lucky that we have got not only acknowledgement of scientific basis, especially in genetics, investigations, and treatment approaches, but there is an increasing awareness by patients, users, and carers for their involvement in the treatment programs. So these are some of the advances that psychiatry and mental health is facing in the 21st century. But as I said that the changing trends, one of the major changing trend is that the concepts in our practice is moving from madness to dealing with mental health problems. And we are seeking new ways of working to improve the quality by increasing cost effectiveness and encouraging innovations in technologies and practices. And this particular change in our concept from madness to dealing with mental health difficulties and problems is also focusing on relapse prevention, improving productivity, and reducing overall resource usage in a climate of radical financial pressures. So this has got a number of implications for understanding our current needs as well as making changes in our practices. And then, during the last few years, the COVID-19 has increased the challenges that mental health is facing. Importantly, the issues of workplace well-being, 
the comorbidities, shift to digital care options and online services are providing us with a number of challenges, but at the same time, opportunities for our future work. And one thing which is very pertinent and important that over the years, the role of psychiatrists and other mental health professionals are witnessing a radical change. There was a time when the target of mental health profession was very clear and widely accepted to treat madness. But now we are focusing on treating mental health difficulties and mental health problems. This conceptual change is putting the role of mental health professionals in a very demanding way. And this has also emphasized the importance of prevention of mental disorders and promotion of well-being. So this is one change that World Psychiatric Association is focusing that how can we cope and promote the future of mental health, keeping in view these particular changes. So public mental health, this is not a new concept, but this is an idea that many of our colleagues are now adopting that mental health should be conceptualized and practiced as a public mental health approach. And I'll try to argue and make a case, especially for our policy makers, because we are dealing with a big population that is suffering from mental health problems. And as I said that, when we are extending our targets from madness to mental health, the priority comes for prevention of mental disorders and the promotion of well-being at the same time. And this also involves that there are many other aspects which are beyond the drug treatment. When we look at the prevalence of mental disorders and most life time mental disorders, we see that around 75% of mental disorders start before the age of 25 and about 50% by age 14. So this means it is not only a biological or genetic problem, it is also social and economic impacts that are relevant to different sectors in terms of mental health. And then similarly, the broader impacts of mental disorders on work, families, finances, violence, victimization, and many other social impacts also argue that we need to have a shift from beyond the drug treatment to get more involvement in terms of prevention and promotion. And public mental health is a branch or a speciality that describes a population approach rather than an individual approach to mental health in order to improve coverage, outcomes, and coordination of effective interventions to prevent mental disorders. And this becomes even more important when we are
taking psychiatry and mental health from big hospitals, institutions, to the community, that we also focus on the prevention and the promotion strategies. So mental health needs to be conceived and practiced as public mental health. And it is not only basis on the individual approaches, but also on a community approach so that sustainability stays there, reducing mental disorders and promoting the well mental well-being. And we have seen over the years that there are effective mental health interventions in the field of public mental health that shows very impressive results and outcomes, not only in terms of cost effectiveness, but also in terms of the real outcomes. And that also makes a case for a need assessment before we start making any plan or program on mental health. And as per public health concepts, public mental health interventions, we have now plenty of evidence that there are available at primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention levels. The need is not only to explore that what is needed for a specific population or for a specific country when it comes to making future policies in this area. World Psychiatric Association, which is an association of 145 member societies from more than 120 countries and representing around 250 plus thousand psychiatrists all over the globe, works out its action plan every three years. The current action plan was prepared with an outstanding need to provide, to, to provide access to high quality mental health care in all settings. And this Triennium's action plan defined emerging needs and priorities in specific areas of mental health within a worldwide perspective. So what we started in 2020, these were some of the six major areas that we considered that these are important in terms of our future work. Of course, youth mental health was a priority. Dealing with comorbidity in mental health, very important area. Partnership with other organizations, capacity building were the other areas that we considered to work through this triennium. But more importantly, we believed that we should try to promote psychiatry and mental health as a discipline of public mental health. And to get this, we organized an action plan group on public mental health that was given a task to prepare guidelines, directions, and outlines that how can we improve the implementation of public mental health interventions in different countries. And also explored the possibility of working with willing countries to facilitate the identified funding, policies, and directions that could help the mental health professionals. And of course, to disseminate public mental health relevant work, including publications, presentations, and training programs. So this 
has really taken a great initiative from World Psychiatric Association. And just to give you a very brief eye overview that over the last couple of years, we have published a number of articles and papers in the leading scientific journals emphasizing about the importance and the implementation of public mental health approaches in the mental health. And these publications have certainly attracted a lot of interest, especially among our young psychiatrists, young mental health professionals. And we have been approached by a number of countries that if we could help them in shaping their health policy, keeping in view the concept and the implications of public mental health in their health care programs. WPA also organized a thematic congress on this particular topic of public mental health and associated opportunities in 2022. So looking at the current needs and what the 21st century is asking us to make changes in our concepts and practices, the way forward is that we need to understand public mental health. We need to look at the increasing visibility of global health and development discourse with importantly in different areas of planning and emphasizing that mental health now needs to look at a population or a community base in addition to looking at an individual approach. You just look at some of the infectious diseases that followed the guidelines of public health, looking at HIV AIDS, or even looking at the recent experience with COVID, it was very important that prevention and promotion became integral component to get an optimum result in terms of the effectiveness of our programs. And then we should not only plan these programs, but we should also look at that what are the sustainable effects of these programs in terms of improving the quality of care. So dear colleagues, the way forward is that we as professionals need to be more proactive in promoting mental health. The old concept that when somebody was talking about mental health, everybody thought about a mental disorder needs a slight change. When somebody talks about mental health, in addition to a disorder or a disease, we should also start thinking about mental well-being. And the mental health professionals are the appropriate professionals who could promote the promotion and the well-being while sitting in their clinics. The best example you can see, the practice in diabetes, the practice in heart conditions, and in many other medical specialities, that in addition to the treatment, the emphasis is on promotion. So why can't we consider including this particular topic and area in our curriculum and in our future planning that in addition to the treatment interventions, we should also make our professional colleagues well equipped with these particular areas in prevention and promotion. And for this, we certainly need a collaborative approach. And we have to really look at different components of public mental health. 
estimation looking at impact and associated economic benefits from improved coverage of effective public mental health interventions is freely available and there is ample evidence that if we work on these strategies, there could be a lot of savings in the future mental health programs. And then that also looks at the collaborative advocacy and leadership between different health and social sectors. Just take the example of child mental health care. It is not only the mental health professionals, the colleagues from social and other health care disciplines are equally important. And then this mental health indicators, which are in the form of adjustment, well-being, should be added to routinely collected data in our health care systems. Because more we know about the satisfaction of quality of life of our population, more we will be able to be aware about what are the real needs and what are the changes that we have to imply. So the key message is that let's perceive and practice mental health on the principles of public health and make it a public mental health approach. This doesn't mean that we are undermining the importance of drug therapy. We are actually advocating and supplementing that in addition to the pharmacological treatment, we have to look at the psychological interventions, particularly in the areas of promotion and prevention and any other related areas. So the key message which we would really like to pass on from the World, Health, from the World Psychiatric Association's platform to psychiatrists is that while we are improving the image of mental health, we should highlight public mental health as an integral component of our practices. And this will also help us in empowering our patients and supporting for their rights when it comes to open and informed discussions. For the policymakers, we would like to request that public mental health should be included as a new priority setting in the domains of care policy, delivery, and service organization. And while we are talking about sufficient resources to treat and prevent, we should also look at equitable distribution of resources for mental health. And for the civil society, this is a slide that I have taken from an NGO working in the UK. And this is the message that we need to really give to the public. And this message says, when, you, when your car breaks down, you can get help within 60 minutes. But what happens when your mind breaks down? It can take months or even years. I think this is the promotion of well-being and promotion of mental health that we need to take all these stakeholders on our side. So I would request that let's lobby for making a case that mental health evaluation should be on evidence, not on perception. And the changes in the services should be based on needs. And the changes in the policies as per burden of disease. And that certainly needs listening to our patients, families, caregivers, and also changes in the training curricula and the capacity building efforts. So we would like to get your support so that we can dispel negative views towards mental health enhance the perception of well-being 
mental well-being in particular and improve the perception of mental health as a promising career and increasing psychiatric and other mental health recruitments at different levels of care. So I would like to conclude that the take home message should be public mental health is a global and a local need. Public mental health is realistic. Public mental health shows the implications with an emphasis for mental health delivery, policies and future direction. And public mental health and the impacts of advocating public mental health is indeed should be an agenda for all of us. So I would really recommend that we must establish a think tank at each professional society or association which should emphasize and look at promoting a frank and constructive global, regional or national debate on the issues of including public mental health as a priority in our day-to-day -day clinical practices. And with these words, as Professor Wanketa has mentioned about our World Congress this September, we are having a specific importance and visibility to public mental health in the scientific program of our forthcoming World Congress. Thank you very much, and I wish again the best and the greetings from World Psychiatric Association. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Abzal, for sending the message about the comprehensive plan of the WPA for the action plan for 2020-2023. That was a clear message. I hope that it will uh, be very clear when we come to the next speaker. And I beg the honorable audience that if you can keep the questions, the comments, and the responses until we continue with the next speaker, which is also about Abu Dhabi mental health strategy. You see that we are talking about the same coin in two different aspects. The next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Nahida Ahmed, who is a pioneer of psychiatry in UAE, and she's going to talk about the Abu Dhabi mental health strategy, the highlights and achievements, which is the current status and future strategy. And uh, say a few words about Next speaker, Dr. Nahid Ahmed. She's an American board certified Emirati consultant psychiatrist uh, who serves as the chair of the, uh, of the Department of Abu Dhabi Health Services, uh, chair of the Behavioral Health Council uh, at Saha, and chair of the Mental Health Task Force at uh, uh, Doha, the, the Department of Health, sorry. Uh, she, she graduated psychiatry residency from Tufts University and obtained clinical fellowship from uh, Harvard University, Boston. She continues to play a lead role in the mental health uh, reforms, uh, 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 spreading uh, several uh, initiatives across different uh, sectors. She is an international associate of Royal College of, of Psychiatrists UK and is a certified physici physician executive. Uh, Dr. Nahida is an adjunct associate professor at the College of uh, Medicine and Health uh, sciences in uh, UAE University and associate lecturer at Khalifa University. He has authored and published several research uh, papers and uh, nationally and internationally. He's a notable speaker, 
Latina today on national and international platforms an avid uh, reader, travel enthusiast, mother to three exceptional, ex exceptional children, and spouse to a distinguished transplant nephrologist. And that means a lot. Uh, I can assure you that I am a living witness of what she's going to say. And I commit myself to what she's going to say. But I knew he's a pioneer who is currently involved very actively and enthusiastically in the promotion and development of mental health service in Abu Dhabi. Dr. Nahida. Thank you. I cannot express how delighted and how profoundly humbled I am by the introduction. Uh, I'm a big fan of Dr. Zain. Uh, we are definitely going to be talking about the future of psychiatry that we've designed, but let me assure you, none of this would have been possible if not for the phenomenal work that they have laid down for us. The pioneers of psychiatry for Abu Dhabi are truly the ones who, have, who are in this room, majority of them, starting with Dr. Zain. So thank you so much for having me and giving me this opportunity. Um, I've spoken about this model on different platforms and my enthusiasm each time I present is just, it amplifies more because I think we have a beautiful model uh, and if we did, inshallah, implement this in this entirety, we would be having a close to utopian state for mental health, which is wishful thinking for sure, but inshallah, it's, nothing is impossible. Uh, before I start, I also want to thank my team members. If this, none of this would have been possible if not for their tireless dedication to the cause. Uh, we've had some ups and downs and some obstacles. COVID came and pushed us back several days, by months actually, but uh, the team has been dedicated enormously to, to uplift and it's beautiful for me uh, to witness not as a provider for mental health and a person who deals with mental health uh, patients on a day-to-day -day basis to see people who are not mental health expert, experts come together and dedicate themselves to, uh, to uplifting the cause and making the life better for most of our patients. Uh, I have a little bit of modifications in the title that highlights and achievements will be discussed in the next session by my colleague. Uh, Dr. Modi, I would be focusing on the integration of mental health in primary care that uh, is at the core of our mental health strategy. Um, I have no disclosures to make. The objectives are pretty straightforward. We will try to understand uh, capacity and demand mapping. We will understand the process, how we came about uh, designing this strategy, the challenges and gaps that were identified, the strategy will be discussed in detail, in, including its initiatives by Dr. Modi, but I'm going to just highlight a very uh, broad overview of what we have. Um, we will identify some key components of the strategy, demonstrate the mental health integration in primary care, uh, which has been, as I said, the core of our uh, model of care, and we would recognize some achievements that we've uh, established from implementing this model. So the model of care, uh, to begin with, I mean, to just put you, give you the perspective, Department of Health does this exercise where in every few years we do an analysis of uh, capacity of Abu Dhabi's all healthcare sectors. It's not ex specific to psychiatry. Every uh, specialty care that is offered in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi is studied and they identify where the challenges are, where we are, what is lacking, and also the needs for the next uh, several years are mapped. And this document is readily available by, for public access on the Department of Health website. It's a really um, strong document if you are interested in the public health and how the Abu Dhabi government uh, envisions our strategies for the, several, for the next coming years based on the mapping that we do. So when they did the mapping in, back in 2017, they did realize that psychiatry had a red flag. We were uh, scarce in several aspects of care, not just workforce, but also in terms of um, the beds that were required, uh, the outpatient clinics and the consultation rooms, et cetera. And when we, uh, we adjusted to the demands, the growing demands that we would be facing by 2030, we were really behind the mark to even catch up. Now, mind you, these are all numbers before COVID-19, and I'm sure after COVID-19, these numbers have exponentially risen, and the challenges have become just more so grave. 
It was pretty straightforward. The demand was exceptionally high. I mean, it's been high in the region as such because of the growing uh, conflict, people moving from different countries, coming and resettling immigration, the economic crisis that was building up and brewing, and now post-COVID. Uh, so the demand has been globally high, and it was exceptionally so here because we did not have enough of infrastructure to to facilitate the uh, you know the, the services that were required. So if you looked into the document, you would realize that the overnight beds were limited. We are uh, at we're not even at 253 now. This was the proposed uh, model in 2017. Because of COVID, we have not touched the mark of 253 yet. But by 2030, we are supposedly going to be close to be in a proximity of 1,000 beds requirement, which is really staggering. And uh, we are far, far from the mark. The psychiatrist by FTE, again, globally, we, don't, we cannot have enough psychiatrists, and the demand is just ever growing and also the mental health uh, outpatient clinics. The mental health care in terms of beds, et cetera, where we, we were measured in terms of how much requirement would happen realistically, what could we do to match, and numbers were put together uh, as, a, as a baseline for us to build the strategy. Now, once we realized what our, where our scarcities or where our gaps were, we did benchmarking. We went and studied different countries across the world to see what worked best for them? These are countries with good socioeconomic background, uh, more resourceful, and have been rated as uh, you know, happiest nation, for example, Norway and Finland, et cetera. When we compared ourselves to different countries in terms of workforce, again, we may be really rich in resources and economically more st stronger and stable than most of our countries in the, uh, which we were compared to, but not in mental health. Uh, Facilities-wise, also, we were far beyond the average that was uh, seen across the developed countries. In terms of uh, the need, there was a... Uh, so people were not diagnosed with mental health. That did not mean that we did not, we do not have mental health problems. The issue is that the, the rate of diagnosis, the average rate of diagnosis was so staggeringly low and for multiple reasons, be it stigma, the social stigma, the access to care, because Back in the day, going to psychiatrists was the only way you were diagnosed with psychiatric problems. There was no active screening. There was not enough awareness for people to understand. Unless you are floridly manic or psychotic, mental health was not an issue. So many myths and different mis you know, perceptions across mental health caused us to have very low um, diagnosis rate if you were to con um, to see across the board, the average diagnosis rate in developed countries were 50 to 60, and we were less than 10 in some cases. And more of that it was in the more common cases, such as depression, anxiety, etc. Suicidal ideation against suicide was a big challenge. Until recently, it was uh, penalized. People were um, either given a hefty fine or prison time for attempting suicide. We were sending a wrong message, like, don't try to kill yourself, but if you do, make sure you're dead. Otherwise, you're going to be locked up. So it wasn't very um, fair to people who were suffering and distressed enough to take their own lives. And this was raised because it had to do, um, a lot of these people succumbing to suicide were youngsters, young adolescents, children. So this was brought up as a big priority at schools, at different uh, health sectors level. And it's, again, in the core of our strategy recognize and help individuals in a timely manner. The landscape-wise, there was quite a few psychiatrists. If you were to say, does Abu Dhabi have enough psychiatrists, they would say we have more than a good share of psychiatry, but that was only the city of Abu Dhabi. If you were to travel, uh, if those who are new to Abu Dhabi, we are, the city is not just, uh, it's just a small portion of the whole Emirates. We have a huge section, which is the Al Dafra region, or what we call the Western region, which is underserved. But there are several of um, you know populations existing there in small clusters, especially during the, towards the oil rigs, completely underserved when it comes to psychiatry. And again, the middle regions, as you move away from the uh, the, the inland, the island, you would see very few, even private clinics, investing in uh, having mental health services there. So the, this, the services were so haphazardly located that the access was a huge issue. I've, had, I've seen people who would have to take a ferry and then a chopper and then drive three 
uh, hours to come and get their Ciprolex refills, which is really unfair because people tend to drop out of care if it's made so difficult for access. The other challenge which continues to be today, but we've been working around it, is uh, insurance coverage. We've not had insurance uh, coverage for the non-locals or the non thicca population, and mental health can be quite expensive uh, service to access. But this is something that's been, uh, since COVID, we've been rallied behind this cause, and inshallah, very soon, supposedly this year, we will have uh, a resolution in which we will see some coverage for the, even the basic uh, mental uh, insurance holders. Primary care, when we benchmarked our model to others, we noticed that a lot of other countries uh, utilize their primary care more efficiently than we did. Although we do have a very robust primary care model, which is literally the gateway for any kind of speciality to be, uh, you know, people to be trickled in and filtered through, we were not utilizing it as such. So this is just a brief background. We will talk more in detail about the strategy and the initiatives, but based on this benchmarking and the deficits, the Department of Health came up with a design and recommendations and that gave birth to our model of care, which is quite holistic. So what we did is that we identified top 10 challenges and we tried to map those challenges with initiatives. Now, what Department of Health has done is that we did not bother copy-pasting anybody else's model. We didn't say, Canada does this, great, we will do what they do, or US or UK. We tailor-made and customized the model for our people because we are a unique population. It's a melting pot of different nationalities and different ethnicities, and we wanted everything to be uh, different. You know, I mean, it would wanted everything to be tailored and customized to their needs. So these are the top 10... Um, challenges that would be addressed, which will be, uh, we will explore more in the strategy presentation as such. But this is the, in general, a broad view of, uh, of the model of care. There are three basic themes. Staying healthy, which involves a lot of education, awareness programs, because uh, the stigma and the lack of knowledge was a huge impediment in our services. So we've been robustly promoting a lot of um, promotional activities uh, especially with our stakeholders at Abu Dhabi Public Health. Getting better under that theme came a lot of initiatives where we standardized care, we made sure the access to care was good, the workforce deficits were, were addressed, um, the quality. So as you can see, we are a bunch of different people from different backgrounds, even our training backgrounds is quite diverse. So people could receive different uh, you know, format of um, uh, services or different disciplines of service for the same problem, depending on whom they showed up with. What we've tried to do through Department of Health, we've tried to standardize it, benchmark that with uh, you know, evidence-based guidelines, and we have set KPIs, monitors, to make sure that every hospital, every entity, every clinic provides a certain standard of care and they are held accountable for that. Um, again, treatment uh, and coverage is a huge debate that's ongoing. So the last theme is sustaining health. We started with prevention, giving you treatment, and we all know as providers that unless we have a full functional recovery, we've done no good. Patients with mental health illnesses are oftentimes given a life sentence that you cannot work, you are disabled, you cannot marry, you cannot have a family. But our approach has been, and my colleagues from FCA will discuss and explore more about the initiatives under this aspect where we want to reintegrate people back. Uh, as you saw in Dr. Abdul's pr uh, presentation, we've moved from institutionalization to community psychiatry. Now we are talking about functional recovery. Every individual should have some purpose to live for, and so do mental health, mentally ill, more so they rely on that purpose. And we are preparing infrastructure for that, uh, that purpose, where people can access and live a more productive life. Uh, so primary care uh, integration, it, this is a topic close to my heart because I also work out of a primary care uh, service. Although I'm a psychiatrist, we've been doing a lot of building of resources in a primary care settings and it has been tremendously well. We have Dr. Medhat to, uh, and Dr. Mufid to thank for. He was one of the first psychiatrists who started in AHS clinics back before even I joined uh, AHS. And that's where it all started. We have not just embedded uh, secondary care in primary care, but we have also trained a lot of our 
primary care providers to be able to recognize and address mental health problems. So to give you a broad overview, why did we get onto this? We had a lot of uh, disability, and just like everywhere else in the world, a lot of our individuals, majority of them in the peak of their youth, are seeking disability, going on social security checks, leaving workforce because of depression, and this is just a growing popular problem. And, and more so because it's not being addressed in time. So people don't just one day wake up with severe depression, disability. It, it's, it brews for years and years before they come to a stage that they become so debilitated and disabled from their illness. What we are trying to do here is to recognize, screen, and intervene early so they don't lose their functionality and they don't have to go into disability. Uh, there is some, there's a data that, uh, you know, that really proposes that mental health in the Middle East has become a growing challenge. And again, this is a study pre-COVID and post-COVID, the numbers would probably look totally different. Pre-COVID itself, because of the, all the conflicts in the region, we've had a 97% increase in just over a decade from uh, mental health, in mental health problems. And they also studied the workforce and the way the, the infrastructure was available in the whole MENA region, which is the Eastern Mediterranean region, um, EMR region, that is. There was a severe deficit, 73 mental health workers and 42 hospitals per 100,000 uh, heads of population, which was staggering. This is just a replica of you know, it's a representation of what was found in that uh, study. It's so, as you can see, those countries are not based on their economic status or their resources. Every country has a fair share of mental health problems, and this is not, uh, this does not necessarily have to do with how much wealth the country possesses. It's basically, broadly, the, the stigma and the deficits were seem similar. Now, why do we want to uh, spend on integrating? Why bother in, uh, you know, upskilling primary care providers? Why not keep our volume and our patients to ourselves? I mean, this comes up all the time. Even when I was training in the U US, we used to have this debate. Most psychiatrists were difficult to, uh, to buy in and let go of the concept that we could have shared care and do it alongside our primary care providers. The simple answer and the most appealing answer is because this this got money on it. If you invest one dollar in it, you're going to save up to six point five dollars, which is a lot of money. And in today's environment, where the conversations or the lingo is all about volume and you know out you know revenue and P and Ls, these slides really help me to push that agenda. So if you can see the top. Uh, you know, the top table, the, the arthritis, asthma, these are all the most common bread and butter of primary care practices. And when you have these conditions with existing comorbid mental health conditions, which are quite prevalent in these diseases, and you address them or treat them without treating the mental health problems, you're, you're not getting resolution as well as you would be getting if you were to treat the mental health. In fact, the cross cutting, the cost cutting is almost 50% in most cases when you address mind and body, that is your medical and mental problems as such. Again, the same thing goes to show there's lots and lots of data here in terms of how much cost effective this model is. Um, there are lots of resources. If you looked up collaborative care, model of care, you can get a lot more uh, numbers if this is something you want to push as an agenda in your entities. Again, through 2030, we are just going to be seeing a surge in the cost, and if we don't act smartly, and if we don't see, uh, you know, try to optimize the resources that we have, we will be ending up spending a lot of money on mental health problems. Another reason is that there is uh, the hospital, the burden on the hospital, and the, first of all, you have such scarcity of, uh, of workforce and such shortage of hospitals and, and specialized care on top of that when you when you don't utilize your primary care you're adding more burden additional burden to your tertiary care that results in in longer stays because there's not enough outpatient follow-up that results in more sicker people because there's no continuity of care people fall through the cracks and don't follow up in in treatment so the Again, I can't emphasize enough the, the burden of disease and the cost burden is humongous when it comes to mental health. And we have to act prudent in terms of um, taking the best approach to this. 
Physical diagnosis, 29% of the time of physical diagnosis or medical diagnosis associated with the mental health problems. And 68% of the time of mental health problems is associated with a physical problem. And when those two disciplines don't talk to each other, you get a lot of untreated mental health and a lot of untreated medical health. I happen to see this all the time, and I'm fortunate enough to be working alongside primary care consultants and specialists where I can do an immediate and prompt reference. I see patients all the time with chronic schizophrenia who have not gone in for their labs or their regular physical showing up at my, in my clinic with a hemoglobin of seven, um, with you know, not had any screening for cancers. Mind you, our people are just as uh, vulnerable to the cancers and the chronic diseases like anybody else. You and I would have the privilege of getting active screening ahead of time. We will be diagnosed with prediabetes ahead of time and intervene. But our patients don't, don't get that privilege. And this is why all the more important that we emphasize that there is a multidisciplinary shared care approach. So, if these were a population, let's say 10 individuals with diagnosed mental health problems, each one of them has a mental health issue that requires treatment, how many of them do you think would actually end up receiving? Just a guess. Show of hands. One, two. You're quite right, actually. So four of them will actually endorse, I have a mental health, out of which you're talking about six people with mental health problems who will say, who would not ever even come out and say, I have mental problem. The four that who say, yes, I do have a problem and I'm looking out for help, only two would end up seeing a primary care provider and two would see, 2% 2 of them would see a mental health provider. Now you can realize how precarious it would be for those who end up in primary care setting in a primary care facility where they don't have upskilled or trained or more insightful primary care providers. They are going to lose their medications. They are going to lose the continuity of care. They will not have the proper management. And this is where the, those 2% is where we are trying to build through our strategy by uh, upskilling programs. Now, this is the, re the regular model where the, all the services that we have are poorly coordinated. Majority of the times, it's not the problem of not having services, it's having services in the silos. So you have robust primary care centers that can do all these screening and wonderful, phenomenal work who work completely in silos. Then you have substance abuse completely cut off from the rest of them. Mental health services such as social support system is not communicating with others. So what collaborative care or integrated care we are trying to do through our strategy is merging them together. We are making connections and networks and bridges between these. So that way, I mean, one biggest example of our strategy and the, the connections in, when it comes to networking, that me as a provider, I have access directly to the regulator. So right now, being a provider in the field, chairing a task force of different individuals from psych nurses to psychologists to psych social workers to psychiatrists from both public and private uh, realm, we have access now to the Department of Health and we can, like this morning we had an issue with medications in the pharmacy being scarce. Immediately we know whom to contact and write to. This was not existing. So that bridging or the stakeholder, collabor stakeholder collaboration has been pretty precious for our services. So why do we need? Because as I said again, we have a huge amount of stigma. Every single patient that I've seen, maybe 95% of the time, they would have gone to spiritual healers, they would have gone to sheikhs in the, the mosques before they come to me. And of course, many of them otherwise would have shown up at the EDs, um, think, assuming they have having heart attack or some form of cardiac problems. We've always been the Cinderella service or the last resort for most people. And now with this integration model, when we hand out a PHQ-9 and GAD-7 to even seemingly normal people for screening, they start asking questions about what it means to be depressed. There is more awareness about what it means to have anxiety. And more people are coming out and saying, I do think I need help. So this has really resulted in a good shift just to screening. Um, and then again, collaborative care addresses the whole model. So we are treating both mind and body. We are treating the whole person as such, and therefore the outcome of the treatment and the recovery has been really significantly better. 
healthcare costs that we've already uh, highlighted, and uh, prevention and interven early intervention. So the whole strategy focuses on uh, uh, mental health from a preventive medicine point of view. So we are not about just let's treat you, we are also about let's not get you worse, let's find out before you get into the illness, and let's see how you, we can reintegrate you back after you've been treated. It's a step model of care. Um, we start, primary care is the gatekeepers. They are the first owners of your healthcare. We have across Abu Dhabi, uh, you know, integrated EMR system through Malafi. We can access medical records from any facility now. So the primary care level, you are the gatekeepers. You come, your patient belongs to you. When the patient needs a referral, they go back to their specialist care, be it dermatology, cardiology, whatsoever, and they still come back to the primary care. So this makes sure that the longitudinal relationship that primary care providers already maintain with their, with their patients is more reinforced in terms of their mental health care as well. So this is a simple sketch of how the, the patients navigate, like this, patient, this person, Salma, for example, is coming to the clinic with, uh, for her baby's checkup in a, in a postpartum phase for well baby clinic. The physician notices that something's wrong, Salma looks a little withdrawn, she's not well kept, uh, that, and it's not her usual self, so she sends her to a care coordinator who does the screening questionnaire, EPDS or PHQ-9, G87, whatever, goes through the whole uh, story and then promptly refers Salma to either a psychologist or psychiatrist, depending on the needs. So Salma was not even a patient for primary care, but we made an effort to recognize in time. So this is quite precious when it comes to um, being proactive and not reactive in providing services. And we want to keep the basic uh, services, like mild, moderate, mild uh, anxiety, depression, which can be requiring just you know, brief psychotherapy or brief lifestyle modification or education, whatnot, at the primary care level. When it gets a little bit tricky, they send them down to the secondary care, which is an outpatient psychiatry. And then from there, the patient goes down to a highly specialized, let's say the person has addiction or psychosis or eating disorder or something more advanced that requires specialized care, they trickle down into the tertiary centers. So the strategy really emphasizes on where the patient belongs and how the pathway path of the care happens. This is simply a sketch of how that is happening. As I said, the, P the patient always belongs to the PCP. It could be a man or a woman. I'm just being biased here. Uh, but I made the psychiatrist a man. So the psychiatrist is just a consult guy. He, he or she is called upon when their things get difficult they do a consult and refer back the patient. So patient really necessarily belongs into the, patient, uh, the primary care circle. We did a little bit extra in SEHA at least. We have this integrated, we, or we are building on integrating this in the OBGYN model because we've noticed a lot of women uh, and the stigma as such is very profound when it comes to pregnancy and per uh, perinatal period. So we do active screening of, EPD, uh, of pregnancy with EPDS, even postpartum as well. And that, of course, this is the section which requires a lot of social services and social support, and which is where our friends from FCA, EWA, and ECA come in play. Now, finally, just to highlight some of the initiatives, we did a lot of primary care upskilling. We've been doing it for the last two years. This year, again, we would be restarting it soon. We choose primary care providers from across the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. We have, last year's batch came as far as Liwa and remote regions in Al Dafra, uh, Dafra uh, you know, hospitals, and they went through uh, upskilling themselves in the ins and outs of basic um, mental health problems that could be encountered on a daily basis, such as depression, anxiety, perinatal uh, causes, how to screen for children with depression, anxiety, et cetera, substance abuses, um, what did I miss, dementia. So these were the six modules that were recognized and people were upskilled. When we upskilled the physicians in the first half of the year, the later half of the year, the physicians came back with the nurses from their clinic. There was a pair almost. And then the, together then they went through basic psychotherapeutic approaches. So there was a trickle of an interpersonal therapy, motivational interviewing, CBT, et cetera, uh, train, training given to them. 
we did one notch up compared to the rest of the regions. We, we saw that a lot of patients are very happy now coming and seeing a psychiatrist. But when it comes to the treatment, they go to go Dr. Google and they get really freaked out and they say, we don't want to take the medication. So we started upskilling pharmacists. And that was really helpful to take that loop, uh, you know, the bottleneck out, because now patients sit down with the pharmacist, they have a proper one-to-one -one counseling session where they can actually get a complete uh, understanding of how our medications are not addictive, how our medication safety profile is much better than most of their medical medications. So in conclusion, this has been really a wonderful journey for me personally, a very gratifying one. We've just get, gotten started, and as I said, we wouldn't be here if not for our pioneers and people who have laid down a very strong foundation for us to build on. And it brings to the um, end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nahida, for this precise and concise presentation for a very wide topic. But a very interesting topic. Now I think we, the floor is open for discussion, comments, questions, responses. Assalamu yeah. alaikum warahmatullah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zain, Professor uh, Afsal, and Dr. Nahida. Uh, here I'm talking. Where is the? Uh, yeah, Doctor uh, Afdal. It's it's really uh, uh, good to see your future uh, uh, progress for this from madness to mental health. But uh, as you know, it's uh, now very expensive uh, to uh, uh, teach and train psychiatrists from medical school to be a consultant at the end after seven or eight years of training, the changing in, in uh, UK, in Canada, as well as in, it can take seven to eight years. And uh, on the other hand, we are, I don't know, the uh, public is um, going to uh, madden the next uh, generation, we don't know, you know, the, uh, the uh, legalization of a drug, the, uh, uh, liberalization of sex, the changing of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, gender identity, and so on. So, uh, how can we uh, do the service in the in the in the in the public where we couldn't really uh, prevent it? And uh, higher up, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahdi. Uh, you are absolutely right, and as uh, Dr. Nahida also mentioned. We will never ever have a psychiatrist in that number who can really take care of all mental health problems. The best way forward is what WPA has shown a model that to improve the knowledge and the skills of medical students while they are having undergraduate medical education. I always give one example that if all the psychiatrists look how many, their, uh, how many of their class fellows from a batch of 100 or 150 become psychiatrists? Must be two or three. So this means that around 95% of medical students, either they have got no idea about mental health or they don't want to be in this particular career. So for this purpose, WPA initiated a program to promote psychiatry among medical students. I think that is probably the best way forward, that we concentrate on those medical students who may not choose psychiatry as a career, but at least when they are practicing as physicians, surgeons, diabetologists, cardiologists, at least they have got some sensitization about this particular topic. That is one way forward that we can invest in the medical student, undergraduate medical students, just to sensitize them about these changing needs of mental health in their specialties. Yes. More questions. Thanks very much I, for uh, both distinguished speakers.
uh, for the fascinating talks. Uh, my question to Dr. Nahida. Um, you mentioned about uh, the suicide and decriminalization of suicide. And I think we also need, that needs to be associated with change of the language. I still hear a lot of psychiatrists, let alone uh, other doctors or the public, speak about committing suicide as if committing a crime. And I think, you know, we need to recognize that um, the language needs to change. You know, uh, people, when they, when they are self-harming, they are not necessarily committing suicide. You know, they are expressing their distress. They are expressing anger. Uh, there are many, many reasons why people self-harm. So I, uh, I would like you to comment on this, please. Um, thank you, Dr. Hamid. And it's, it's a very important questions, I think. And um, our colleagues in the Department of uh, Abu Dhabi Public Health have, are doing a great job in terms of uh, addressing it in the proper language, as you mentioned. And we do have, uh, you know, from time and again, people review and revise the sentencing, the campaigns, the words that are used. We've put together resources, for example, our helpline. It's a crisis helpline, and we don't necessarily go out and say it's suicide. We're talking about, okay, this is the time for seeking help and everybody needs help at some point. And the bravest thing to do sometimes is to come out and ask for help. So empowering people to look for help and additionally think of themselves normalizing that not being okay and not being vulnerable is okay. And there, is, you know, there are resources that they can access. Um, and, and this is, of course, we are far from where we should be, but it's process, and inshallah, we'll get there. Yes, Dr. Anahid, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Afdal, for the very elaborative presentation. As I'm working in the field for many years in this country, and I think we are still far from achieving our goals. The problem that we set the goals, and we know everything about it, but we are alone here. There is no decision maker uh, 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 around us. My problem for many years, how to reach these people, how to convince them to believe what we mean. So I can speak for Emirates of Abu Dhabi, I can't speak for Rasul Khaimah, but for sure in Emirates of Abu Dhabi, as I mentioned, part of our strategy has been to create those stakeholder collaboration. Uh, for example, I'm the chair of the task force, but under my task force, I have representation from American Center, from Maudsley, from hospitals, uh, from Al Ain, even the Fra region. And not just physician representation, we also have psychologists, nurses, we have university representation. So right now, as of today, I can say that the conversation and the channels are wide open, and uh, DOH has been very receptive and responsive. Like this morning, there was a question about Wellbutrin not being available in the market. We brought it up to the Department of Health that this, there are lots of patients who are at risk of relapsing for the complete absence of albuterin in the market, and they're going to work on it. So I think this is what MOH needs to do as well, have a task force, and perhaps you can navigate through them. Okay. Now, after this... Uh very informative uh, session. I think I have to uh, thank the two distinguished speakers for being very informative and very knowledgeable. And for the special thanks to the audience who have shown a good example of good listeners. Thank you very much. And uh, we hope that we join you in the coming sessions, or coming Congress next time. So, uh, thank you. I have to conclude and thank you again, uh, Dr. Professor Abdal, Dr. Nahida, and uh, those who contributed to the discussion. And thank the audience for being very tolerant and patient. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. <laughs>